All right, I'm going to begin now. We're running a couple of minutes, one minute behind schedule, but uh, let's jump right in. First, uh, let me welcome you all to this afternoon's panel discussion on OpenStack networking. And uh, although the panel uh, description in the uh, schedule talks about agile networking using OpenStack, actually, I think a better title would be simply OpenStack Networking Issues and Alternatives. Uh, my name is Chris Marino, and I'm going to be the moderator this afternoon. And uh, we have four panelists here from a um, range of uh, providers and uh, integrators that I think can really shed some light on this uh, very complex topic. So I'd like to begin by making a very uh, simple observation that uh, OpenStack networking actually is based upon some really very familiar, uh, simple, rudimentary primitives. I mean, we all know. Uh, that it's based, that each tenant network environment is based upon simple primitives, networks, subnets, routers, and services. And from the tenant perspective, this is all really very simple and uh, rudimentary. So where does the complexity get introduced? And I think it's really under, important to understand that the complexity of OpenStack networking is really driven by the requirements to deliver isolated multi-tenant environments in a scalable way. So if you introduce the requirements for Scale for isolated tenants on a massively scalable uh, fashion. In order to solve that problem, that's where some of the complexity gets introduced. Furthermore, if you want to add uh, more complex topologies that go beyond simple networks and ports and so forth, you have to introduce how do you do service insertion? Again, a, an opportunity for a tremendous amount of complexity to be uh, introduced into the system. Add on top of that the security requirements for. Um, Application deployment, you can imagine that uh, that uh, introduces yet another dimension of, of, of complexity. So although it starts very simply, it very quickly mushrooms into a great deal of complexity that needs to be managed uh, by, um, by either the user or the, or the operator. So again, I'll very quickly uh, run down the networking alternatives. I'm sure most people in this room are very familiar with the different alternatives. If you're running simple Nova-style networking, you have three choices. You can run just simple flat networking where the virtual machines are um, uh, bridged out to the physical network. You can uh, add to that DH a DHCP agent where the tenants get uh, IP addresses uh, locally. Or you can introduce tenant isolation through VLANs, in which case each VLAN, I'm sorry, each tenant is provisioned its own dedicated VLAN. That's fairly simple, fairly understandable, and Nova style networking is very, very popular. But if you want to introduce some of the more advanced services, what you need to do is go to the Neutron uh, module or Nova OpenStack networking. And with that, you're able to do all the things you can with, uh, with Neutron, but you're also able to overcome the 4K VLAN limitation using overlay technologies. And the overlay technologies, you've probably heard some things about that. It uses a variety of different tunneling encapsulation techniques. Really, that's not a, a particular uh, topic we're going to go into here today. But you have different choices for that. Neutron also introduces the ability to uh, uh, manage, uh, do service insertion and provide load balancing as a service, firewall as a service, and so forth. And uh, recently, with a Havana release, it uh, allows you to uh, more simply uh, and directly access the existing physical network through something that's known as uh, a provider network. So you have, with a, a Neutron, a whole new set of uh, ways to uh, deploy your OpenStack network. Now, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the answer to the, 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 these uh, networking question is, uh, is like many other answers to complex questions, and that is it really depends. And uh, I think it really depends based upon who you are and what your requirements are. And I think this conversation would really be uh, rudderless if we didn't really try to nail down some very specific uh, use, case and use cases. So what I've proposed here are four very uh, simple use cases that describe uh, very different requirements. And I'll just very quickly run through those. And through our panel discussion today, we can refer back to these to understand where a particular feature may or may not be relevant. So just very quickly identifying these, you can imagine a very high traffic web service or website that's basically one tenant, one environment that's, open, that's using OpenStack to deploy elastic infrastructure. Another uh, user profile could be a single data center enterprise that has a couple of dozen applications that are virtualized to a certain percentage, 50%. They may have some physical assets existing that are accessed on the physical network. So that's a very different user profile with a very different set of requirements. 
You can imagine that environment scaling up to multiple data centers where a large enterprise IT operation could have hundreds of applications, different business units with a whole different set of security requirements and multi data center uh, environments as well. And at the very far end of the spectrum, you can imagine a very uh, sophisticated cloud service provider that's looking to deploy infrastructure as a service along the, along the lines of an Amazon style cloud or maybe more specifically a virtual private cloud offering to, uh, to their end user customers. So with that as the, maybe the four user profiles, I put together this matrix here. We're not going to go into a lot of any of the details of that matrix, but I'll leave it up for our panel discussion. What it shows is some of the uh, characteristics of those, of those uh, profiles that really are going to drive some of these decisions. And sort of the, one of the decisions that I think people need to uh, come, uh, go to right away is whether or not they're going to use Neutron or, or, or Nova. And a big part of that is really determined based on how many tenants you need to support. And if you can stay underneath the 4K limitation of, uh, of the VLANs, you can actually may, may be perfectly uh, well suited to live uh, uh, with a Nova style networking in your, in, your, in your deployment. If you go beyond that limitation and have to deploy um, uh, uh, more than 4,000 isolated VLANs, you ne may need to deploy uh, hundreds of virtualization hosts that sort of run up against the networking limitations of spanning tree protocol and other such things. You may need to introduce tunnels into your environment. You need, may need to introduce uh, IP fabrics into your environment. If you span across different data centers, you may need to introduce BGP and MPLL MPLS VPNs and so forth. And again, this thing gets really out of control very quickly. So with that as the context, I'm going to begin by letting our panelists introduce themselves. And let, let's start, start at the far end, because I have a, the first question is going to be for, for Nick at our far end. So let's begin by uh, allowing each of our panelists to introduce themselves, and uh, then we'll kick off our, our discussion. Uh, hi, I'm Rudra Ruge. I'm part of Juniper Networks. And joined Juniper through the Contrail acquisition where we worked on the open Contrail solution. It's an SDN controller. Hi, my name is Rohit Agarwala. I work for Cisco. Um, I, I was one of the first core contributors towards the quantum project, now known as Neutron. Um, and I'm actively involved in the Neutron project. Hello, folks. I'm Somik Behera. I'm a product manager at VMware's networking and security business unit. Prior to this role, I was one of the members of the product team at NYSERA, a pioneer network virtualization company. And I was also one of the founding members of the Quantum Project, which is now known as the Neutron Project. Hello, I'm Nick Barset. I work as VP of products at Innovance, a company that helps variety of customers deploy OpenStack for a variety of business cases, ranging from uh, internal uh, dev and test clouds to public clouds, including all kinds of private clouds. And we are using various network topologies and tools in order to solve their needs. Great. So with that, let me begin by asking Nick the very uh, obvious question. When you engage with your customer uh, and, and they're wrestling through some of these different decisions, how do you propose and describe the situation to them and help them uh, understand what the trade-offs are and uh, make decisions for some of these uh, issues? So what's interesting is that since uh, the previous release of OpenStack, since uh, uh, for the past six months, I have not seen any more any cases where Neutron could not be used with one very simple exception, which is application that require multicast. Um, but in every case, we try to get away from the technical merits discussion of one solution to the other and stick to the business use cases that the customer is trying to support, which applications do they need to support. And that's based on the list of requirements that the customer has that we will pick a solution that is the most appropriate for them. The, there is today, I believe, 12 different plugins for various solutions to implement Neutron. Um, we currently master three, four of them. Uh, we are closely involved in the development uh, of uh, ML2 and L3 uh, support uh, inside of Neutron itself. And in general, um, we will be able to find the appropriate solution out of the uh, three uh, other SDN or the pure open source solution uh, that is built into Neutron for all of our customers based on their business requirement, not based on uh, technical merit discussion. 
And we very often, uh, once we have the discussion on the business use case, turn back to the various uh, uh, SDNs to check the list of requirements that our customer have with them. And um, at this point, we've been very satisfied in being able to provide the right answer to the right customer uh, based on these discussions. Um, there, there is um, a, an increasing level of uh, support of the basic use case using uh, basic Neutron together with Open vSwitch, the uh, ML2, and uh, the standard L3. There is still some uh, issue in achieving high availability with that, but I believe that will be fixed soon. And for much larger needs uh, than um, each SDN has its own sweet spot. Great, thanks. So let me uh, change gears slightly and ask uh, you, Rohit, uh, I mentioned in one of my user profiles an enterprise that has physical assets that on, on an existing VLAN. So integrating into the physical infrastructure is, is almost always necessary, and if, and if you're using this switched VLAN model uh, that I talked about, can you talk a little bit about what, alternative, al what alternatives exist for people to actually access physical resources on existing VLANs? Yeah, sure. So one of the things that got introduced in Neutron uh, is, is the concept of provider networks. And, and specifically, if you're using VLANs and you have a requirement to be less than 4K tenants, then uh, provider networks allows you to connect to your, to your already existing physical uh, networks and make use of those services. Um, so, so you can also use uh, uh, existing top of rack switches. Uh, and this could be from any vendor without naming any. And those vendors can provide the VLAN accessibility on, 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 those, on, the, on the top of rack switch. Uh, for layer two. In addition to layer two, you can also configure some of the layer three services on the top of rack to, to get the performance uh, that you cannot get on the compute host. Um, also, with, if, if you're using most of these services on the top of rack, you can connect your compute host in multiple HA models, uh, such as using the VPC model to, to allow you to have uh, redundancy and even better link utilization. Uh, so, you, you know, using these different techniques, uh, you can use the existing physical infrastructure in your enterprise to, and, and deploy Neutron on top of those. And these are the existing features that exist, uh, you know, within Neutron today. Great. So, Nick, uh, when you talk to customers, I imagine you have to deal with the issue of accessing existing databases or going out to physical load balancers or gateways. How do they, t what, what sort of things do they need to uh, tackle there and how do you... Uh, Propose that people um, uh, solve some of those problems. Is this a, what is Rohit is what Rohit suggested a preferred path for them, or are they looking for uh, alternative ways or simpler ways, different ways? Um, so it, it really depends on how uh, what the customer wants to achieve. As soon as the customer is not willing to um, uh, support a single application but multiple applications then we want to maintain a very clear separation between the overlay and the physical hardware. And meaning that what the tenant does on the cloud should be remaining uh, at the overlay level. What the operator of the cloud does should remain at the physical layer of, of the cloud. This could be using the same or two different SDNs, but there will be definitely two different instances. And uh, I, I've yet, in that particular case, which is the general case of cloud usage, uh, seen a case where tenants should have access to, well, indirect access to modifying the underlying hardware. Okay, wonderful. So you touched on, on uh, overlays there, uh, Nick. So let me ask uh, Somic this question. So we've talked about the 4K limitation of VLANs and that is the threshold that you typically would, you, if you did cross that, you would necessarily require tunnels to uh, provide tenant isolation. But so, Meg, what would you say to someone that didn't need 4,000 isolated VLANs about taking on the complexity of implementing an overlay network in their OpenStack environment? Good question there, right? Uh, before I take on that quest uh, question, I want to make a point about how do you do physical bridging in, in actually OpenStack environments with the existing environments, right? So the basic semantics of Neutron were connectivity as a service. So you have concept of subnets and ports. 
So you have two options to connect to your existing network. You can take a port, you can have an L3 hop, and if L3 is acceptable, you can connect to your physical network at L3. That's how Nova Network did it, right? That's how packets exited north-south. The second option is you have L2 semantics. You have an L2 port. You can put anything in that L2 port and connect it to some other network, right? One of that devices could be a bridging device, L2 bridging device. That's one concept what some of the uh, open source and closed source commercial plugins do. They actually use L2 semantics and bridge it to the physical network. That's how your physical network is integrated in the OpenStack environment or at L3, right? So uh, just to make it, make it clear, I wanted to reiterate that. And the second, to uh, answer the question that Chris was asking me, why use overlay networking when you don't have uh, 4,000 VLANs? That's a good question. That's a common question, right? I mean, why do I have to deploy more software if I don't need it? So the, the answer we got uh, deploying our solution with OpenStack, some of the earliest OpenStack production deployments, is what was important to these customers was actually speed to deployment. How, how do you actually not touch anything physical? Programmatically, how, how can you achieve in a single click deploy the whole application, multi-tier topologies, multiple L2 network, firewall rules across all of it, and, and there are router and the routes configured in a single click. And that's, that's, that was a key critical element of network virtualization adoption. Like if you would see JC Martin's eBay talk uh, an hour earlier, and you know, they went from deploying applications in four weeks under physical infrastructure to getting it done in, in about one minute. Uh, with, by going to network virtualization with OpenStack. And that's the reason PayPal is standardizing on OpenStack because of the speed to innovation. And that brings in business agility, which is more than CapEx, OpEx, or anything you might have. And so that would be my answer. It's about speed to innovation. How can you develop, de deploy, dev, you know, show business the value by increasing their agility and their speed? Great. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, so we've sort of walked up the progression of, of these requirements here, and sort of like that at the very tip of the pyramid is a multi data center deployment of, of OpenStack. And that introduces a whole range of new networking technology that, that need to be tackled. But, uh, but uh, and there are some products and capabilities that are, are in uh, solutions out there that uh, try to address this directly. But let me ask Rudra this, this question in, the, in an opposite way. So if you are running in a single data center, um, when would, BG, using BGP to uh, distribute routes and getting access to those hosts, is that something that is uh, meaningful in a single data center deployment, or does that only really solve the problem of multiple data centers spread across the WAN? Uh, that's a good question on how we thought about the problem of uh, you know, moving from L2 to L3. So we looked at all the connectivity within the virtual environment as L3 connectivity. And what better way to distribute routes or information about all the VMs that come up uh, you know, other than BGP? So we use BGP as a control mechanism, which is not really exposed to the user in a way, and use that information to push to rather your provider edge all the information that is needed to connect to your cluster. So this is one way of internally within the data center uh, managing your cluster. And what you can also do is using MPLS VPNs, use QoS parameters to talk from one data center to another data center and extend your cluster across data centers. So this is something that you can use in a single data center environment uh, as we looked at it. And Neutron provided all the right abstractions in terms of uh, the ports, the subnets, and networks, and using the provider edge as well. Uh, and we were able to extend across data centers using the BGP MPLS, MPLS mechanisms. Great. So that actually leads me to, to the next question. I'm going to, you know, anybody who wants to chime in to an answer for this. So you talked about MPLS VPNs and so the scalability that comes with that. Uh, very often, people talk about uh, using overlays and tunnels on top of an IP fabric. That's just a fast forwarding plane. Um, but a lot of people are still using standard switches with, you know, spanning tree protocol running, you know, uh, determining the, the path through the links and so forth. Um, I guess the question is, you know, at what point do you think you need to really deploy the IP fabric and sort of what, what, what sort of conditions exist that would make you require that, uh, it's basically a new set of infrastructure 
that uh, might need to replace your, your standard uh, you know, Nexus or other uh, layer two technologies? Yeah. I would use tab added, uh, and you guys can follow up and correct me if I'm wrong. So for, when you talk about overlay, or specifically about network virtualization, the three fundamental characteristics are you, know, you decouple. You decouple from anything underlying. That's how virtualization happened, right? That's how VMware did virtualization of virtual machines. You, there was no dependency on the physical CPU. Right? It's completely debug, decouple, and you reproduce it, and then you can automate on top of it. Right? So by definition, that means if you're decoupled, you don't, you know, it doesn't matter if it's L2 or L3 or IP fabric. You can non-disruptively deploy it anywhere. When do you make the decision to deploy it or not? It depends on your requirement and your bandwidth throughput and your network design and architecture best practices of how you want to do it. But the key is that if you need the speed to innovation, if your use cases require private networks, if your use cases require overlapping subnets which are not possible in using other mechanisms, that's when you make this uh, make the switch right. to network virtualization. Right. That's all true. That's all true. But let me yeah. let me be specific. The question I'm asking is sort of the opposite question: mm -hmm. that your physical network is running up against the limits of spanning tree or link congestion or something like that. And yes, you've abstracted through tunnels and that's wonderful, but the physical infrastructure just doesn't support, you know, the, the yeah. Yeah, yeah so, the physical network wouldn't change. Your physical network challenges, you know, you're still in a robust physical network to support anything on top of it, right? And that you have, you know, we have proven operational tools, proven mechanism to build physical networks, good architectures, and, you know, we'd have to follow that. Because at the end of the day, you know, you can't break laws of physics. Somebody has to forward packets, yeah. and that infrastructure has to be stable and solid. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. So, Nick, do you run a, up against this particular thing where you actually got a saturated link? There's some wacky, you know, d you know, hotspot that you uh, want to design around, or is this sort of something just we sort of think about in the lab? So, uh, when we do, it's obviously always uh, due to a faulty physical network design. Uh, that is generally due to a bad understanding of what we will need to support because what we try to do is to slice our deployment into uh, pods which have enough bandwidth to sustain any kind of uh, overlay configuration on top. And if we don't size a pod correctly, that's when we are having the, the issue. Um, the, the pod can, can be uh, one to 10 racks depending on the type of workloads that we are expecting uh, on, on this particular data center. Um, but to come back to your, um, to, to your question, when is it that we switch to having uh, SDN at the, uh, at the physical, well, uh, that would control the hardware mm -hmm. at the physical uh, layer? That's when you need to have fast reconfigurability of, by the operator of the hardware in order to match a new redeployment of the environment. And when you're considering that we are releasing a new version every six months, that new uh, use cases are being deployed uh, every day, as soon as you're talking about a, a large deployment, you take into consideration how you're going to be able to reconfigure your network dynamically each time you're going to do a redeployment. That's interesting. So let me just make sure I understand this. So what you're saying is that you might have an, a, a virtual environment uh, with virtual machines scared across your different hosts. And what you're saying is rather than sort of doing vMotion and sort of, of doing some sort of affinity with you know, virtual machines, reconfigure the physical infrastructure to alleviate that hotspot. Is that what you're saying? So uh, to some extent, yes, we can do that. But more often, it's when we reconfigure a pod to have a new type uh, of workload, because uh, this is something that is commonly done when we operate uh, a, a large data center. In that case, we want to be able to reconfigure the network to support new use cases that, was, that were not planned initially. And the less we have to uh, modify the, uh, the, the, the switches individually, the more we can treat the switches uh, as hardware that we configure through code, the happier we are. And this is what we get by um, managing the, uh, the physical hardware through uh, an SDN solution. Got but again, we want to, uh, in 90% of the cases, we want to keep two layers uh, that are very independent, one from the other. The only information that goes from one to the other are the priority information, the metadata. 
Got it. So let me ask a question for anyone that wants to, to chime in here. So uh, probably m many of you know in the audience, certainly everyone on the panel knows that uh, Nova Networking is, they've talked about deprecating the uh, Nova Networking APIs so that Neutron would sort of be the default use case. I hear uh, from people who have deployed uh, uh, OpenStack that they're quite happy with Nova Networking and will sort of fight that tooth and nail going forward. So let me just throw this out to anybody that wants to jump in here. What's the future of Nova Networking? Yeah, so, you know, I've been in sessions, design sessions that involved, you know, talking about Nova, parity, Nova Network parity and also discussing Neutron pain points. Um, so it, it was interesting in both those sessions to hear out, you know, the two sides of the coin, actually. Uh, but to be honest, you know, going forward, the abstractions that Neutron provide, and like Somic was mentioning, I think so those are very critical for your applications, for your network engineers to be making use of. Uh, no one network provides you that simplicity and the ability to quickly spin up the VM and attach it to a network. Uh, but at the end of the day, you need those abstractions defined so that you can, your applications can make use of it. Um, I know we talked about in the previous summit to, to deprecate NOAA network in Icehouse, uh, but I think so this time, uh, Russell, the PTL for NOVA, and Mark McLean, PTL for Neutron, they, they've, they've got together again, and we've, we've definitely made this a, the higher priority. The only, uh, from a parity perspective, the feature that's not uh, existing in Neutron today is only the multi-host DHCP feature, uh, which, which basically means if, if one of your hosts, which is hosting the DHCP agent, uh, dies down, your entire, uh, there's a bottleneck in your, in, in your Neutron deployment. Apart from that, uh, you know, there is a complete parity with NOAA network uh, against Neutron. Uh, the other dimension that's actually missing is just uh, from a user point of view, the appropriate documentation and, and the onboarding from a NOVA network to a Neutron deployment. And we are also exploring the upgrade paths of doing that. Okay, so. So in addition to, of course, you know, the parity effort that's going to be uh, taken care of over the next year, uh, the other angle that comes in on Neutron is the additional extensions that a lot of people are asking, uh, in addition to what was supported in NOVA network. There's things like policies, connectivity groups, affinity groups, which a lot of vendors, a lot of customers are interested in. And you know, going into Neutron, it provides us that flexibility of adding this uh, as we move forward and uh, make the networking components uh, add more value to the user. Okay. Go ahead. As I said earlier, this is a really uh, weird thing, but for us, from the customer we have been servicing for the past six months, none of them uh, would require Nova Network anymore. And I would advi advise, unless there is a very strong use case, for example, scientific usage where you have a single application uh, or uh, cases where you need to use multicast, uh, I would advise customer against using Nova Network because we know it's not the way to the future and we want to be able to enable them for a little bit of time, not just for today. That I understand. I appreciate every uh, point that's been made here, but let me tell you, I've talked to many end users who, that to respond with a very simple answer, which is, I want to. All I want to do is deliver Amazon-style networking, and that's just flat networking, and uh, that's my cloud. So uh, those folks have um, uh, sort of de um, de featured their clouds to support a you know a different, simpler execution model. And um, so for those folks, um, they may be a little harder to uh, be, you know, uh, drag over the finish line. Um, uh, so let me ask uh, the, the panel here. Um, uh, layer three services is something that uh, is an ongoing topic of discussion. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure what my question is here, but um, uh, could those be the things that make it an obvious choice to uh, endure the complexity and headache of rolling out uh, uh, Neutron and all the agents and all the complexity that goes with uh, um, uh, rolling out these uh, capabilities? Anybody want to answer that? Have an opinion on it? So the, the question of deprecating Nova networking has been a long one. <laughs> Since it was since the day Neutron was started, you know, how do we de deprecate it? And 
you know, Nova Network was just built in to Nova. It, it stopped innovation, but it was easy to be, get for people to get going. And over the last couple of re releases, Neutron has, the Neutron core team has made it a priority to actually not only make it functional or make sure the performance is at par at what Nova Network was providing. We've also improved documentation of how actually to get Nova, uh, Neutron up and running. So that was the key use cases are very well defined and documented. I think all of those are going to help. And now that the second step is actually the two folds, two, two aspects which are going to drive people away, you know, to the future of getting rid of the legacy, getting rid of never networking. First, as, as, a, as a PTL, a technical committee, you know, you, ha you can't be shackled with the chains of legacy, right? OpenStack is about innovation, it's about moving fast. And if you're chained because of our own legacy, that, that's not a good thing. So that's why, as, as uh, Roy was talking about, you know, the PTLs of Nova and uh, Neutron Project have decided to make it a priority that it is deprecated, right? It's a strong message to the community to start moving to the future. The second aspect, which people are, which is going to, that's a stick approach, right? But you also need the carrot. That's what uh, Chris were ref referring to. And I believe there's a whole lot of richness coming into Neutron, right? It's not only layer three services, but now there was there were a lot of talks and vendors supporting Elbas. There's Elbas is natively there as, as an open source plugin as well. That's load balancing. There's firewall as a service, and we're talking about VPN as a service. Any of these ad 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 additional services, which which get which are required when you deploy a more sophisticated application if you're beyond the POC stages, if you're not beyond your initial cloud, <clears throat> become pretty imperative. And I think those are the carrots which are going to be drive people from Nova Network to Neutron, as well as a stick that is going to be the developer saying that we cannot spend so much engineering resources supporting legacy. Yeah. So let me, uh, let me, go ahead, Nick. So um, go ahead, you can answer. Go ahead. So for me, the, the complexity of uh, Neutron from uh, the end user's perspective goes away as soon as you introduce an orchestration tool, as soon as you go up the stack and you start providing applications. Suddenly, it's the orchestration template that is piloting this complexity. And this complexity is actually needed in order to provide smart, scalable application. And it is not anymore a complexity that is visible by the end user. And I think most of the deployment are now at the stage of going to uh, that layer. And this is what is really important. So uh, the argument of let me use Nova Network because it is simpler to use, um, I think is a, uh, yeah. living its final moment. So, yeah. that, so let, let me just add there. I mean, uh, talking about L3, Neutron offers uh, the extensions, which Rudra was referring to, right? Like, creating a router, right? Defining floating IP addresses, which are public IP addresses. No one network doesn't have those. And, and using those APIs, the L3 abstractions within Neutron, any plugin can be loaded up to implement that. So you could have OVS, you could have Linux bridges, which are the popular open source options, and even the vendor options, right? So, so those flexibility and options within Neutron definitely predominates over NOAA network. Right. So let me ask one, uh, one more question here. It'll be our last question, I, and if we still have time, I'd uh, open it to the audience to ask uh, the panelists questions. But touching on your point, uh, Nick, just a moment ago about the orchestration solution, how many of these more advanced networking features do you think are going to be exposed through Horizon to the tenant? I mean, this is something I wrestle with a lot when I talk to users because you've got sort of the operator's requirements and then the, what you choose to expose to the tenant. And so does anybody have an opinion on sort of the future of, of, of tenant-facing networking capabilities in OpenStack? Anyone? I would start by defining two types of tenants. There's a technical tenant that knows how to use Horizon, and there is the non-technical one to whom you are selling from a software catalog. For the software catalog, this won't be exposed but heavily used. For the technical tenant, it will be exposed and eventually used. That's my point. Yeah, yeah I totally agree with what Nick said and what we are seeing is that there are infrastructure as service tenants. These are like application developers, architects who define these applications, who need the low-level semantics of how you define an application, how do you put you know, the load balancing policies, round robin, what, what it should be based on, who understand the application, what it needs. And then there's you know, projects like Heat, right? Projects like uh, Amazon had the same thing. It had to go through the same evolution. There were infrastructure level primitives, and then there was, uh, what is it called, Amazon, uh, 
uh, cloud formation, cloud formation thing, which actually you know, an end user can say, I want a scalable Word, uh, WordPress application. It can be a cloud formation template, which somebody else who's a technical the decision maker, design architect has designed it, and they can they consume it. Similarly, in OpenStack, now you have the heat orchestration engine, which is on top of these low-level primitives, and you can say, I want a you know, heat template which says, I want, I want a scalable WordPress application, and he gets it. He doesn't have to know what kind of load balancer it is, what's the round-robin policy, how it is firewalled so that the web tier is compromised, doesn't mean that database gets also attacked, and all of that stuff. And I think that's how it's going to evolve as it has evolved in the public cloud space. Any other comments on that? And so certainly what comes in with these orchestration systems is, you know, enhancement of projects like Neutron. You know, this is where all the layer 4 to layer 7 services, as Chris was mentioning earlier, come into play. And there's, there's a there's significant effort going on, on on the Neutron side to add firewall load balancing as a service, as Somik was mentioning, which are essentially consumed by higher layer orchestration systems to make it easy to deploy your two-tier, three-tier apps with whatever needs they have. Great. Um, we only have just about three minutes left. Uh, I have another question for the panel, uh, but I can hold that back and maybe give the audience a chance to ask the panelists a question. Uh, question right here. Can you, I'll repeat the question if you don't want to. Yeah, that's fine. Um, Big Switch recently uh, abandoned overlays. You've mentioned tunneling and you know, the overlay model. Big Switch abandoned that because they didn't believe that that was scalable. I haven't really found any research that would suggest that there's a threshold at some point where you know, the, that model becomes uh, inappropriate in a hyperscale environment. Do you, can you theorize the threshold that was at which point Sure. Yeah. Did everyone hear the question? I'll just very briefly summarize the question. The question was, overlays, a big, he said Big Switch had, I'm paraphrasing, abandoned their overlay approach, and uh, the issue they claim was the scalability of tunneling technologies on a massive scale. Are there, is there anything specific that uh, is available to overcome that limitation? Paraphrasing, so sorry. I can't speak for Big Switch's implementation and why it didn't scale, but what I can tell you about is that you know, one of the world's largest clouds, non-OpenStack-based clouds, the Google Cloud, Google Compute Engine, did, did just released, if you look at any of the Google I.O. Uh, keynotes in YouTube, is, it's a full overlay uh, virtual network. That's what every tenant gets. One of the largest, the second largest, one of the largest uh, public clouds, again, which is OpenStack-based, is Rackspace, you know, that uses overlay technologies. And there are many customers who have spoken here who use um, overlay technologies. So I would, I would again defer to these environments of how they have actually made it work if it wouldn't scale. So that, that would be my answer to that. I'll just add into that. I mean, defining overlay technologies also depends upon where you start your overlay tunnel from. It could be from the vSwitch itself, which is within the compute node, or it could be at the edge of the physical infrastructure. So those are two other options. For example, OVS has an implementation uh, previously where you'd had a complete mesh uh, tunneling, right? So that wasn't a pretty scalable. Now they're coming up to a solution where you can partially create a mesh. Uh, versus if you start from a physical switch, if you start in your overlay, then you have fabric-based solutions where you have a cloth-based leaf-spine architecture and it creates a fabric for you which you know, has, a, has a different overlay implementation using VXLAN, fabric path, or any of that sort. Uh, those are more scalable solutions as compared to just starting from the hypervisor switch. And also, if you look at BGP MPLS solutions, you know, what comes into play is leaking of routes in the right manner to, to really scale out as opposed to uh, a full mesh-based scheme. And that would certainly help out in the, in the tunneling overlays. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll just uh, conclude on this final point. You know, what is a tunnel? I mean, a tunnel is you know, just another tag in the header. So is that a tunnel? And you know, there have been a uh, number of success, um, successful tunneling technologies that uh, just simply add a tag, you know, MPL, MPLS VPNs, for example, is a tunnel. So I think you can't say categorically tunnels can't scale. Or I think uh, it really all depends on uh, the implementation. Uh, so um, anyway, uh, with that, I think we have run out of time. So let me thank my guests for joining us here today. And uh, if you have any questions, you can maybe come up to the panel. And uh, if we have time, we'll answer whatever we can. Thank you. <laughs>